else? I think it's a combination of, of both. I've, I've talked about this a few times now, that some of the adjustments we made, just with um, practice, our, our focus, where we need to get going to, uh, trying to make sure uh, we're in tip-top shape and form by the time we hit Pac-12 tournament, and making sure our bench was ready. Uh, we worked on some things to, to strengthen ourselves uh, individually. And I think through doing that, it gave us a sense of freshness, a new focus as you go into a tough stretch of your season. And certainly the rewards of that were uh, competing against Oregon really tough, but then coming home and really competing against Colorado and, and Utah. And now all of a sudden it traveled onto the road with us as well too. That, that mental toughness that's been missing, uh, we've, we've started to find it and we've started to duplicate it again, and that's a good thing. Is Drake at the point where he's, he's, he's practicing in full and full contact? And do you think that that's translating onto the court where he's more consistent playing better match for you guys? Yes, no, no question. That and the fact that he's starting to see the teams for the second time around. Because even for a graduate transfer, you, if you've never been through a Pac-12 uh, conference play, if you've never seen these teams, how big and strong Arizona and the Oregons are, uh, Eubanks at Oregon State, that was all new to him. For as much as I wanted him to be successful, and he wanted to be successful, uh, he needed to go through it as well, too. You put that together with being able to uh, get more practices in, he's starting to find his rhythm. And when you find that rhythm, you start to play with confidence. And that's why I think you're starting to see the difference with him as well. I think the thing with Malachi is, is, is similar again. I just think it's taken him some time to understand how to lead. And the thing I'm most impressed with him is how vocal he's getting in the huddles, particularly late game in the huddles, where he is spot on in what he's telling the guys that's given them confidence to want to get the ball to him to be the go-to guy in that. So, again, I think that's a maturation that's taken place with him over the course of this season. And it, sometimes you have to go through some adversity before you learn how to do things correctly. And we certainly have gone through that. And I think as a result of that, he's starting to come out on the other side. We're starting to come out on the side, other side, uh, a more mentally tougher basketball team. You know, the biggest jump for players are between their freshman and sophomore year. Then it becomes a, a, a solidarity thing where you, you, you put your individual time in and you really start to, to shoot it more, your body gets stronger, you're, you're in your, your individual time in the weight room and stuff like that. You start to get some things figured out and then all of a sudden you become a really, uh, what I would call one of the premier players in the, in the league. I'm hoping that's where he's headed to in terms of next year with him and his game and everything. Uh, yes, I've had a few of them like that. Uh, Luke Rittenauer comes to mind, was like that. Aaron Brooks was a little bit later, but those guys were, were surrounded around some really good players, too, uh, that were just as clutch. So as this team gets better, Malachi is going to get better. He'll even get more clutch because uh, I think, again, uh, he will gain confidence from them. They will gain confidence from him. I think the biggest thing with him is he's, he's starting to feel a little bit more confident and his body is just more healthier now. And, and consequently, what you're starting to see is a guy just playing with more confidence because he feels better about where his body is, feels better about his game. And then again, some of the adjustments that we've made in practice, I think is helping all of these guys where we've gone away uh, from doing a, a lot of drill work, uh, a lot of scrimmaging, and we really focus in on doing a lot just a ton of individual work, individual development, and, and, and collectively they're all starting to get better and do some things a little bit sharper and everything. What can you say about Drew's ability to just kind of, like you were saying, get through the injuries and fight back and just make a difference on the team that's on the court? You know, I, I think to, to his credit, um, it's been a lot tougher for him, I think, than what he thought it was going to be. Uh, he had that success against Arizona in the tournament last year, and all of a sudden everybody's like Arizona. Every team is that good. 
And it's been a struggle for him with the injuries and just finding his game and wanting to prove himself to these guys as well, too, why he made this jump to come here. Uh, I'm happy that he's starting to have some success. It's gone way too fast. Uh, we're going to miss him immensely. And as he closes out his season here, I hope people realize two things about him. What a special and unique player he is because of being 6'8 and, and 235, 240 and being able to handle the ball like a point guard. But more importantly, uh, a young man that walked away from being probably the best player in their league to come over t to Washington State just to try to make us better, having already graduated and everything else. And he's, he's total team. He's total at doing anything he can do for these guys, on the floor, off the floor, to make them successful. That's very unique in this day and age to find a player that would sacrifice himself like that. And I, speak that, I think that speaks volumes for his character and his mother and his father and what they've done to him in terms of how they've raised him. Because that, that's a tremendous character trait to be able to do that. Should you be more inclined to browse the grad transfer pool more often when you see the player like Drake and Duke for a program? I know you guys have a few leaders next year. Uh, you'll have a bunch of seniors, but, but just moving forward, do you think it's something that you more often maybe? You know, for him being our first one, he was kind of a, a, a test case. And hopefully he, he has paved the way that um, – uh, everybody involved can see what a unique person he is. I think he's done a, a tremendous job uh, with the college community here, both both in the classroom and outside the classroom, of wrapping his arms around them and rallying people to see how special and unique he was. He is. And if we can continue to find that caliber of student athlete with that type of character, that in one year he could have that kind of impact, uh, not only on your team but on your campus, uh, I would welcome uh, graduate transfers if we can find them like him because he's been pretty special for us. We're going to have to fight them, and very similar to what to do at Stanford, because Stanford is the biggest team. They're big and they're, they're physical. Uh, I mean, Reed literally threw us out of the way several times. I'm shocked uh, more wasn't called, but how physical he played in the game, and we had to fight that. We had to toughen up, and we have to take that same mentality into both of these games. The game for us is going to be about the boards and rebounding, because it gives us a chance to get out and run. Uh, it takes away second chance opportunities because our defense has been good enough. We've just been giving up second chance points. And we gave up way too many to Oregon State and way too many to Oregon the first time around. So we need to continue to do what we did in that Stanford game in the last 10, 12 minutes of that game to control our boards. We've got to be able to keep these teams off the glass, and we should be able to do that. What are the other tweaks you have to make against these schools? Well, for Oregon, it's we have a healthy Robo. He didn't play in that first game. And, and, but with both of these teams, you have to take care of the ball. Uh, we turned it over way too much with both of them. Gave up too many transition points. Not only were they transition points, but they were easy buckets, uncontested transition points, which are the worst kind you can give up. So for both of these teams, first point of emphasis is take care of the ball. And the second thing is take care of our boards. You know, he's another one of those players that the second time through all of this started to get a little bit more confident, even though he's still got a lot, a long way to go. He's starting to play better and being more consistent. And the thing with any of these guys is that the consistency is the key thing. That when you put together a game plan, you know what you're going to get out of that. Well, usually that happens with veteran players. I know exactly what I'm going to get out of Robo and, and Malachi and, and, and uh, Vianti Daniels and everything. So it was more or less – getting Carter Skaggs there. I know what I'm going to get out of Carter now. I know what I'm going to get out of Drick. I know what I'm going to get out of Cooper. I know I'll get out of Stevie Sprayrigan. Q, I haven't been able to tell. And Q and Milan were the two most difficult ones. And now Milan is starting to be more consistent. And now here comes Q. And the key thing we talked about two or three weeks ago is build this so when the Pac-12 tournament hits, we're one of those teams nobody wants to play because we've got a deep enough bench and everybody's starting to be on their game versus being burnt out. We're going to be re rejuvenated, rejuvenated having made some adjustments that we've made and starting to play better basketball now. 
Uh, it's important that we close out these two games the right way. Wishing that we could start the season over, knowing what we know now and, and how these guys are competing and playing and everything. But we need to continue that and continue that right into the Pac-12 tournament. Carter sort of hit that freshman, I guess, from the sophomore wall with the, the last, uh, last 20 stand and then to, <coughs> to get over the area. What do you think was the difference for him? And not a lot of players get over that one once, once they hit it. Well, I mentioned to him that uh, the difference between him and your normal freshman, freshmen usually hit it because they're mentally and physically fatigued. He hit it because of a mental thing, more so than a physical thing, just because of the mental of all the games are so competitive. You have to be on your game so much, uh, game in and game out. So my advice to him was just to stay out of the gym and rest and just let his body come back. And then the uh, the injury uh, in the Cal game was a little bit of a blessing because it gave him a little bit more opportunity to rest a little bit more. But he's going to be fine because physically – he can handle it. It was just the mental part that he needed to kind of get rejuvenated, and he's been able to do that. So I, I expect him to close out the year in a big way. Lamar was in his head at all just with the free throw shooting at first, and, and you saw that pick up over the weekend, and, and just seeing the ball go through the net. Do you think that offers a piece of confidence for, for a guy like that? I don't know if I, I would call it in, in his head, and maybe he, he can only answer that, but I've, I've seen it before, and it's just, again, you know, uh, somebody who redshirted and they look really good in practice. Well, practice to the games is a big difference when that pressure's on you to make free throws, make shots, uh, defensive rotations, getting ready to play. It's just a big adjustment. And to me, again, here we come the second half of the season. He's been through it now. He's starting to get comfortable and he's starting to play better. A lot of that has to do with just being a little bit more experienced and it takes time to get there. You can't speed that process up. And guys come at different paces. And the key thing is as long as they come.